Welcome once again to St. Paul's Church National Historic Site here in Mount Vernon, New York in our series, History from St. Paul's. Today, we continue our recognition of Women's History Month with an exploration of the life and times of a woman named Phoebe Ward from the era of the American Revolution who is buried in the historic cemetery at St. Paul's. Phoebe was born in 1731 in the town of Eastchester to John and Sarah Fowler. The Fowlers were one of the more prominent families in the small farming village, about 20 miles north of New York City. Phoebe probably grew up in relatively comfortable circumstances as the daughter of a prominent family, living in the pre-industrial world of colonial America. This would have included basic literary education, preparation in the skills and knowledge relative to a woman of her station, and attending religious services at the Church of Eastchester, St. Paul's, a Protestant church which served the whole community. She married Edmund Ward, who also represented one of the town's more prominent families. It was a community of less than 500 people, where a small number of extended families often intermarried. Phoebe apparently raised six children to maturity. By the 1770s, Edmund had one of the largest estates in the town, including only several enslaved Africans, and Phoebe was living at a level of comfort which exceeded her youth with her family. The American Revolution was the great transformative event of her life. Her husband, Edmund, was a loyalist. He had worked in 1774 and 5 to seek a peaceful settlement of the conflict between England and the colonies, but once independence had been declared, he sided with the king. The invasion of New York by British forces in the summer of 1776 transformed loyalists like Edmund into a dangerous element capable of collaborating with the enemy in Patriot eyes. In August of 1776, Edmund was imprisoned in White Plains, Westchester County, by local vigilance committees, and later confined in buildings along the Hudson River and in Massachusetts. Phoebe's 48-year-old husband escaped in March 1777, reaching the safety of British lines in New York City, where he spent the rest of the war at his own great expense, awaiting what he and other lawyers presumed would be a British victory and a return to their former stations in life. Phoebe stayed in Eastchester with six of her children, all boys, scraping out a meager existence on at least part of their land on the notorious neutral ground, the label for the area around St. Paul's. They were caught in a perilous no man's land between the British in Manhattan and the Americans in the Hudson Highlands, where no government had firm control. Seeking supplies and forage, soldiers from both sides raided the area and often took foodstuffs, livestock, and material goods from the largely defenseless civilians who remained. The armies also fought numerous skirmishes and residents caught in crossfire was subject to injury or death from these engagements. It was a harrowing time to live in the St. Paul's vicinity. Most of the civilian population refugeed out to safer grounds, but Phoebe remained, and for reasons we can't really articulate, never joined her husband and the loyalist community in New York City. Perhaps with six sons, she had sufficient assistance to weather the storm, for a time, she probably received some protection and support from her brother-in-law, Stephen Ward. He was Edmund's younger brother, and more importantly, the leading patriot figure in the area. He was also uncle to Phoebe's sons. But by late 1777, Stephen and his family had also refugeed out from the neighborhood. The enslaved on Phoebe's farm, including a woman named Anna, escaped, claiming their own form of freedom. In the limited understanding of the day, with women perceived to have few if any strong political views, Phoebe was apparently not seen as a threat and was never arrested by Patriot Vigilance Committees. Did she share her husband's political sympathies or was she resentful because of the predicament in which his departure left her? It's difficult to know, but at some point during the war, she distanced herself from Edmund's support for the British to the extent that it might bring relief for her family. She reported her grave condition in a petition to New York Governor George Clinton seeking material support. Phoebe acknowledged that while Edmund had sided with the crown, a wife cannot alter principles or dictate a husband so far as to change his president conduct in matters of so great moment and of so great importance as this present or past revolutions. There's no record that she received assistance from the state. The end of the war brought even more trouble for Phoebe. June 1783 was a spiteful month in Westchester County. The fighting was over but civil government had not been restored. Anger at the Loyalists reached the crescendo and local committees moved toward the eviction of Loyalist families and confiscation of their lands. Written in desperation, Phoebe's June 6th letter to her husband Edmund in New York City is worth quoting in full. Kind husband, I am sorry to acquaint you that our farm is sold. 
They said if I did not quit possession, they had a right to take anything on the farm or in the house to pay the cost of a lawsuit and imprison me. I have suffered most everything but death itself in your long absence. Pray grant me speedy relief, or God only knows what will become of me and my friendless children. They say my possession was nothing. Your husband had forfeited his estate by joining the British enemy with a free and voluntary will, and thereby was forfeited to the state and soul. All at present from your kind and loving wife, Phoebe Warren. Pray, send me speedy answer. Phoebe Edmund and their children joined thousands of loyalist evacuees sailing to Nova Scotia, Canada for a new life under British protection. Sharing the experience of many loyalists, the wards struggled with the harsh climate and limited economic opportunity in Canada. By the 1790s, as the strongest passions of the war had subsided, they joined the small but steady trickle of returnees. Given Stephen Ward's post-war stature in the community, he was town supervisor, state assemblyman, and a judge, it's difficult to believe that his brother and Phoebe would have returned to the parish without Stephen's acceptance. So we can assume some kind of reconciliation occurred. Edmund's pre-war estate had been petitioned and auctioned off, but the family returned to a much smaller piece of land in the community and quietly resumed their lives, enduring into the new century. The burial of Phoebe and Edmund right behind the church would indicate they were accepted back into the community. Phoebe Ward lived until 1801, age 70, beyond life expectancy for the day, and her still legible sandstone grave mark includes a modest epitaph. Piety and benevolence constituted the chief excellencies of her character, but in no duty was she wanting. Her husband Edmund, buried alongside, died in 1807 at age 78. Please join us again next week for more History from St. Paul's.